Hey, it's Gids. Welcome back. It's that time of year again, and it's got me asking a question no one has any right asking. Can you beat Skyrim as Jesus? What exactly would a run like this look like? Well, to start I'm using a basic clothing mod to give myself the correct attire. There is a mod to have Jesus as a follower, but we all know Jesus was the one with followers, not the other way around. There is also a mod that gives you a giant cross that can deal massive damage to enemies, but it ultimately made things too easy and doesn't follow the rule set for this run. Speaking of which, here are the rules. Only the robes for clothing, no armor. No killing humans. Spirits, demons, and serpents are all fair game. Shouts are allowed if they don't do any damage to humans. All Daedric gods must be conquered. And no shrines or stones can be used. With all that out of the way, we make a decent looking Jesus. Pick a Breton for our class, you'll see why in a little bit, and make our way into a world that needs our saving. Not quite a manger entrance into this world, but it'll have to do. Jesus is all too familiar with being sentenced to death, so this isn't a big deal, but we manage to escape regardless. Once inside, we get our first chance to use the voice of the Emperor, choosing peace instead of violence. I've honestly never used this before, but it can come in quite handy and made this encounter go more smoothly than I think I've ever witnessed. Hadvar is a little unsure of what just happened, but follows us anyway. It's kind of what people feel like doing around Jesus, for lore reasons. I do what I can to leave everyone behind and just heal whenever I take damage. This early in the game you can basically out-heal everything as long as you keep moving. We skip past the stones, sadly, since I'm going to be doing some very unoptimized scaling later on in this run. We stop in Whiterun and sell everything we don't need, including lockpicks since stealing is wrong and I won't be doing any of that this run. I'm trying to save a bit of money so we can buy some better healing spells from Farangar, but we don't have even close to enough money so I decide there was only one way for Jesus to make the money. That's right, carpentry. Or at least the first stage of it. Why carpentry? Lore reasons. After a few minutes of cutting wood, I had enough to buy the healing hand spell I wanted so I could help out our allies, and we went off in search of a follower. Well, actually, first I decided I was going to clear Bleak Falls Barrow without killing anyone, which is actually remarkably easy to do. You can run past the Frostbite Spider and free Arvel. He will always go and die immediately to the first enemy he encounters anyway. Once you grab the claw from him, it's a simple game of running past and healing whenever you get hit. Or you could be me and forget to grab the claw and have to reload the whole area to grab it, since the area now has enemies stuck in the doorways. I masterfully lured enemies into a gate a few times, the button got stuck down on me which was unfortunate, but I managed to use the dragger's weakness against him, which is basically anything sharp. With the gates open, we face our first boss. I tried to turn him with a spell since I've never done that before either, but unsurprisingly he resisted, so I had to go with plan B. You guessed it. Walk him back around the map until he finds his way into some swinging axes. It's not killing, I didn't put them there, okay? I grabbed the dragonstone and headed out. We reported our findings to the Jarl, but there was already a more pressing issue. Luckily I have a bit of a history with serpents for lore reasons, so this kind of quest was right up my alley. That being said, I thought my role was more of a support, and did my best to keep every white run guard alive, which I was mostly successful at doing. God bless them, eventually even they can kill a dragon. We reported back and the serpent had been banished from the Garden of Whiterun. I told Lydia to leave her earthly belongings behind and follow us, for lore reasons, and we took a journey up a mountain. No, we aren't going to talk to the Greybeards. We know they basically worship a serpent, which definitely goes against what we are about. We are here to level up restoration in the best way I could think of. Using the damaging frost wall and healing while it kills us. Now without a shrine to level up our magic faster, this definitely takes a while, but it's not too difficult. It just takes patience. Which after 20 minutes I didn't have and I used a console command to give me the rest. Sure you can say the run is invalid, but I would argue Jesus can use god mode whenever he wants to, for lore reasons of course. Anyway, off to grab the follower I plan on having for the rest of the run. We head out to Dawnstar, this town is plagued by nightmares, and a local and personal favorite, Erender is up to the task of helping it out. By helping out, I mean that our little group of disciples died about ten times to these incredibly strong saber cats. 
If my restoration hadn't already been 100, I think it would have been leveled about 20 times during this fight. I spent so much time running around in circles and using every little bit of healing I could to get Erendur and Lydia back up. After about 20 minutes of fighting cats, we managed to beat them. Erendur took us inside and showed us the source of the problem, the first of many items used to worship a false god. Turns out Erendur used to worship Vermina, but he has since turned from his ways, and since forgiveness is what Jesus has to offer, we decide to help however we can. In order to make our way down, we have to fight through some devotees, and when I say fight, I mean heal Erendur as he does all the fighting. Erendur has a fairly strong mace as well as strong fire magic, so it's not too bad, as he takes care of everyone inside. We drink a potion for him, which allows us to go back in time and teleport behind a door somehow, unlock it, and then head down. We have a short debate with Erendur's old friends, and let him sort out his differences while we support him from a safe distance. After they're dealt with, Erendur starts our ritual to get rid of the skull, and Vermina speaks to us telling us to kill Erendur instead of let him destroy this skull. But since Jesus is good at resisting temptation, for lower reasons, this isn't a hard decision. Erendur is grateful for our help and joins as our disciple in helping rid Skyrim of the rest of its false gods. Off to solitude we go. I tried to stop the execution by using healing hands, but the guards frowned upon this, so instead we grabbed an amulet from his body and went to give it back to his family. While we're looking, we can run into a man whose master has abandoned him, so we vow to help him if we can. Since his quest is nearby, we head inside the abandoned wing of the Blue Temple and find ourselves in a new dimension. We encounter another of the false gods we're looking for, and he gives us his staff to help a local man deal with his night terrors. Since this is the dream realm, everything in here is fair game, we're not actually killing. So we spend a bit of time transforming bears into chickens and whatnot, and eventually Shiogorath tells us he's happy with our work and allows us to go home. We hire a carriage to take us to Winterhold so we can stop by the Shrine of Azura. Erendur proves that he is stronger than the local wildlife, with some mild assistance from us, and we find the shrine we're looking for. Some priestess tells us we are the chosen one, and we head back to Winterhold to get a clue on where this artifact might be. Nelikar, with some slight persuasion, points us in the direction of an old keep filled with necromancers. So I let Erendur do what he does best, supporting him however I can, and we find Azura's star. Turns out there's a soul living inside the star, and since we're in the process of saving souls, we take up the task of getting that soul out. Unfortunately, Erendur can't follow us into this place, so we die quite a few times trying to use our basic fire attack to get rid of enemies that basically laugh at our pitiful damage. So instead, I grabbed the webject that we required earlier and used it and a lot of faith to deal with the enemies I found. I turned Malin into a rabbit at least twice, which didn't help us, but it was funny. Also a mud crab at one point, but eventually we take out Malin and free his soul from the star. Azura lets us keep the star, which is good Oblivion because we have plans for it. You since the day now for everyone's favorite, Meridia, the god of unbalanced volume mixers. Since we haven't touched the beacon yet, she points us in the direction of where we can find it. I run in and grab it without really dealing damage to anyone and take it back to her temple. She raises us into the clouds above our disciple, which isn't the first time that's happened to Jesus, for lore reasons. Inside, casting out evil spirits is right in our wheelhouse, so I used some basic lightning and fire to help out Erendur. Now for the fight that I dread, Mr. One Shot himself. Erendur wasn't a huge help after we got rid of the shades, every time I got him up he went down basically before doing any damage. So after 10 deaths or so I decided I was going to do this another way. I used the voice of the Emperor to calm him down thinking that would do something, it just resulted in some awkward glances for about 30 seconds before the fighting resumed. Eventually, through sheer perseverance and long suffering, we were able to out-heal Erendur for long enough that he got the kill. The shade wasn't too bad, since I can help with the spirit, and we tag-teamed in first try. We let Meridia know that we will not be doing anything in her name, and she doesn't seem to care too much and lets us keep the Dawnbreaker anyway. We head to Markarth. I get the chance to make it the assassin peaceful, which works on him, but not the guards who swiftly kill him after he gives up his murderous ways. We head inside a house that's reported to have Daedric artifacts, but our newfound friend gets turned against us, and he attempts to kill us. 
Luckily, his weapon is no match for my healing ability, and Andrew deals with him while I try to talk to him peacefully. We find the altar and talk to the false god, who tells us to go get him a worshipper of a different false god and bring him over. We rescue him, can't convince him we work for either of the false gods, and just give him some money to go back and talk to Molag Bal, god of basement dwellers. Back in the basement, Molag gets another person with the old spike trap and gives us the mace to kill him. Since technically I wasn't killing, since he comes back right after you hit him, I felt that this still worked within the rules. Unfortunately, after he swears his fealty to Molag, Erender doesn't take too kindly to the information and gets rid of him regardless. Off to Falkreath. In the local prison I find a man who is afflicted with a ring that he thought would help him control himself from turning into a werewolf. Turns out it doesn't, and he wants to give it back to the false god that gave it to him in the first place. So we tell him we'll help return it. So off to hunt a white stag, which took exactly one lightning bolt before we met Hercene, the god of the hunt, who tells us to skin our jailed friend and bring the skin to him. We definitely aren't going to do that, but we will join a group of hunters who are looking to kill him, in hopes of sneaking past them and saving him. He's grateful for our help and asks us to join him in killing these hunters. We're not going to do that either, but joining him could be fun. Apparently, you can't heal him either or he considers it an attack and starts trying to kill you. I did use the voice of the Emperor once which calmed down the hunters as they watched their friends getting torn apart in front of them. Once outside, we let Hirsin know that we don't worship him or any other false gods, and he decides that that's fine and gives us his blessing anyway. Off to visit an orc stronghold, they're not very receptive to humans, but eventually we find one that is willing to talk to us. They have been plagued by giants, and she believes it's because their god is mad at them. Malakath, the false god, roasts the tribe leader so badly I'm not sure our healing spells can even recover him, and we set off to go get a club from the giant leader to prove that he's worthy to lead his clan. The chief fares pretty well against some of the enemies along the way, including three trolls, so my hopes are high that he can defeat a giant. Turns out the chief is kind of a coward, and asks if we want to go kill the giant ourselves, and he can take the glory. I didn't think that seemed very honest, so I told him we would just provide support for him instead. However, if you know anything about giants in this game, there isn't much you can do to support an ally that gets launched 300 feet in the air and dies instantly. But to be fair, the chief did his best and died with his boots on in the end. Poor Erender got launched in the air about as many times as I did, Luckily he always managed to land somewhere in the vicinity and I could just get him back up and try again. About 20 minutes and a lot of kiting later, the giant goes down. We grabbed his great hammer and returned to their camp. The lady seems to have forgotten who we are, but we complete the quest and the great hammer is transformed into another Daedric weapon. Anyway, back to Markarth to deal with some rumors of cannibals. We get permission to go into the Hall of the Dead, go inside and there's a lady talking to us over the intercom I guess. Apparently it's only 5 minutes until the hall closes so I need to finish up shopping and head to the front, or something like that. We find her, she tries to gaslight us into saying we're cannibals, which is a crazy thing to try and accomplish. After she fails her charisma check pretty hard, we head out and let them know that the Hall of the Dead has only dead people in it once again. Off to Riften, we're looking for a certain individual who would challenge us to a drinking contest. I didn't realize this at the time, but apparently he spawns in the first inn you go to after reaching the level threshold. The problem is, I have no idea which inn that was. After about 20 minutes of backtracking, I decided I would come back to this problem later. Off to visit the shrine of Periite? Periite? We use some items we've acquired along the way to craft a potion that allows us to talk to this false god. After huffing the fumes, Periite does what most Daedric gods do and asks us to go kill somebody for it. So we head to the Dwemer ruins, full of guys that puke on us, and heal as fast as we can as Erender takes them out. This doesn't work very well, but luckily the Dwemer watched a lot of Home Alone, so there are quite a few traps for the afflicted to find themselves. We find our target, and it becomes abundantly clear that he is much more powerful than we are. Plus, he's also a human, so I can't kill him. Also, somewhere along the way of running past all the Dwemer, we lost Erender, so that isn't great either. Luckily, the question everyone was wondering, 
How many dwarven spider workers does it take to kill Orchendor? Orkendor? Orchendor? Eh, it's answered anyway. It takes at least more than two. Arendor conveniently shows up when we exit, and we head back to Periite, and he gives us the Spellbreaker shield. Off to Falkreath we go. We speak with a man named Lod about luring in a stray dog with some meat. Turns out the dog can definitely talk and wants us to follow him to a shrine. I say follow, but this dog probably takes the longest path imaginable, randomly stopping and barking for no reason. Which, come to think of it, sounds pretty accurate for how dogs work. We end up in the ruins of Helgen, where we first escaped our execution, and battle it out with some local thugs. Unfortunately for us, I sold all of my lockpicks and haven't picked up any since, so there is an apprentice door we're supposed to get through and no way to get through it. I did find my way over the door, but unfortunately the dog and Erender did not follow me. I waited to see if the dog would spawn next to me, but he ended up just traveling to the destination without me, so I headed out to find him again. After we found the cave, Erender burned some vampires while I supported him until we met up with the dog in his shrine. Unfortunately, Clavicus doesn't want anything to do with the dog, so we try and strike a deal with him. The only one he'll accept is fetching an axe for him. Finding the axe isn't too bad. We have to fight a guy named Sebastian Lort, who is out to enact revenge on whoever named him something that sounds like a skin condition, but he goes down pretty easily. We give the axe back to Clavicus, and wouldn't you know, he tries to get us to kill his dog, which we definitely don't do. As a consolation prize, he gives us his mask, and we make our way out. Off to meet our favorite deranged scholar, Septimus. He has the lexicon we need to uncover another Daedric artifact, so we take it from him, grab the Elder Scroll for fun, transcribe the lexicon, and return it to Septimus. He rambles some things about something and gives us an extractor for grabbing the blood of elves, which sounds like a quite tedious job. After a little research, there is a place called Liar's Retreat where you can get all the blood samples besides High Elf, so we headed out to see if that was true. We are greeted by a host of Falmer, who make short work of us, but after moving past him, we grab Wood Elf, Dark Elf, Orc, and Falmer blood all from one location. This next part I remembered from my playthrough as Heimskir. Near the stones at the beginning of the game, there's a spot where the priests of Mara battled it out with the Thalmor, and they all died. So I collected the blood from the Thalmor, and had everything I needed to open the lock. Septimus gets the door open just as he always wanted, which is good because it's the last thing he'll ever want. Hermaeus Mora tells us that we work for him now. We reject that notion, but we do take his book, which is quite a powerful object, but we're not going to get to use it because we have other plans. Finally, Sam Guven, see what he did there with his name, challenges us to a drink that we've been looking for, and what do you know, we win. After a few, we don't feel too good, and wake up with a few things out of order. The priestess is not too impressed with our actions from the night before, but we apologize and pick up what we can. We paid a man for his goat because I didn't feel like tracking it down. Isolde gave us a ring she wants back, and we don't have the gold for that, so we go track down the lady we gave it to. I use the word lady fairly generously here. She doesn't seem too keen on giving it back, and immediately tries to murder us. All is fair in love and war, apparently. Anyway, Erendur is not having any of it, so we get the ring back to Yozolda, where it rightfully belongs. Excellent. She gives us the final clue about a magical staff we were rambling about, so we go to track that down, vowing to only drink our own water-made wine in the future, for lore reasons. Sam is duly impressed with us. Turns out he's a Daedric god, who could have guessed, and he has decided we've earned his staff, so we take it and go our way. Unfortunately, the rest of the Daedric artifacts required me to be a higher level than I am right now, the highest of which needs me to be level 30. So, back to the Wall of Ice to waste away some more of my life. I didn't do this all at once because I thought it might be smarter not to encounter level 30 enemies when all I have are robes and faith. After a while, we head to Jarl Balgruf, who tells us one of his sons has been acting a bit edgy lately. Well, edgy might be an understatement. This kid is pretty nasty. After talking to him for a bit, it turns out he has been talking to the whispering lady who lives in the basement. Why this child didn't think to tell anyone about this is beyond me, but regardless, we head out to see what we can do for ourselves. 
Turns out he isn't crazy, and there is a lady whispering at the door. She asks us to open it, so we go out in search of the key. Turns out Balgruf and Farangar both have a copy. Now I don't want to steal anything in this run, but temporarily borrowing the key and then putting it back should be fine, right? After a few failed attempts, we grab the key from Farangar and head back downstairs. We find an ebony blade that she would like me to kill a bunch of people with to make it stronger. I made sure to return the key to Farangar since I am not a thief, just a borrower, and take the sword away from anyone who could use it. Off we go to visit a museum in Dawnstar. For what it's worth, it's just a room with some display cases, but since I don't know Skyrim's building qualifications for what classifies as a tax-exempt historical museum, I'll just let that slide for now. Silas seems a little too invested in this whole mythic dawn thing, and tells us about the shards of a dagger he wants to reconstruct. Luckily, I've accidentally acquired one of these shards in my previous runs, Plus, the shards get mapped for us. One piece is up a mountain hanging out with some Forsworn and a Hagraven. The next piece is hidden in the basement of an encampment, and the key is stored with an incredibly strong orc who gets the better of us a time or two. The last piece, we buy off a guy who doesn't want it anymore, but still fleeces us for almost 500 gold. Luckily, we never buy anything, so we have lots of money to spare. Back to Silas. He takes the pieces up to the shrine, but it doesn't work for him. Only us, big surprise. Dagon wants us to kill Silas. Not sure why this is the only plan any Daedric god ever has, but we refuse and Dagon sends out some enemies our direction. I make sure Silas makes it out safely, and we head out to grab the last item we need. Boathia's gang basically just hangs up on top of a mountain and kills each other for fun, which really isn't our speed. They want us to sacrifice one of our followers, but Jesus isn't in the business of sacrificing others. Quite the opposite, actually, for lore reasons. As far as I could tell from all my research, there was no way to complete this without sacrificing a follower, so we leave Boathia's gang to themselves and take all the false god's idols we've acquired so far. We take a trip out on the water, which we can walk on for lore reasons, and find a desolate spot to dispose of all the other false god's artifacts, to cleanse Skyrim of all its idols. With Skyrim finally saved from its false gods, there was only one thing left I wanted to do. So I went back to Whiterun and tried spawning 5,000 fish and 2,000 loaves of bread, but this unsurprisingly crashed my game, proving that there are some miracles only real life Jesus could perform. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate if you let me know with a like and a comment of an idea you might have for a run. I have a list of all the ideas and I'm working my way through the most popular ones as we speak. But for now, I'll see you in the next video.